Hello, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Weekly Shonen Jump Breakdown. There's a lot to cover today, so let's go ahead and get started with Awari no Seraph Chapter 59. This is a pretty decent chapter. There's Gurren's... I say pretty decent. It's actually a, it's a pretty big lore revelation of Gurren's uh, plan to revive everyone that the virus killed. That came out of nowhere. To me, anyway. Maybe I missed something earlier on, but I did not expect... any. And we all knew Gurren had something he was cooking up. This is pretty crazy, though. And, of course, everybody has to, you know, as they figure it out, finds out that uh, this still won't bring back the people who were killed by vampires. And how is it going to bring back people who don't have a body anymore? So there's a lot more about his plan I'd like to know. I feel like this was just the, the tease, the start of it. But we also got a lot of good Mika and you discussions this chapter. We got to see them not only get excited at the thought of the rest of the family being able to come back and then finding out that they, of course, can't, but also their interactions with each other as Mika does not like Gurren at all because he doesn't think that Gurren is going to keep uh, you safe. And you, of course, trust Gurren almost implicitly because Gurren's the one who gave him the strength that he has now. Uh, speaking of strength, he still is not strong enough to control his Seraph, which, I mean, that's to be expected. Uh, you know, went berserk again. The plan is to let him keep going berserk until he learns to control it. And, of course, Shinya had a wonderful moment where <laughs> you breaks into the building and is just letting out this this almost roar of grah, and Shinya replies in the same th with a question. It's just grah? So that's pretty good. Again, Seraph is one of those series that I love the characters, but don't really love the main plot that much. So I'm hoping that this will move forward into something a lot more interesting, if that makes sense. We also have One Piece Chapter 871. This was a great One Piece chapter. Uh, Rogers Bay said it on his interview, or his review, that this was one of the best chapters of the year, and I think he's 100% right. We get the review of Stussy working in for CP0. We got the fact that Big News Morgan uh, talks about big news, but will absolutely cover up stuff and tell as many fibs as he has to to be able to get his stories out there. A uh, judge gets wrecked by Big Mom, just destroyed when Big Mom uses a thunderbolt on him by reaching into uh, Zeus. And using hacky. Then you have things like Ichiji not wanting to. Ichiji basically still doing his job and trying to stop Katakuri, even though, you know, obviously the rest of the family is going to try and help judge with Yanji and Niji both, you know, immediately rushing to his rescue. Ichiji still fought Katakuri. And it's a real great thing for his character. Because the brothers really don't have much of a character between being non-emotional and just jerks that hate their brother. It's just good to see one of them be like, no, look, I've got to do this. This is what I told, this is what I said I was going to do, so I'm going to do it. Uh, he didn't say that, obviously, but he he clearly meant something to that effect. Unless we, it's just that we find out next chapter he just really wanted to fight Katakuri, it's possible too. Either way, I feel like it's a good step for his character to be doing something separate. Obviously, though, Katakuri wrecks him. Uh, off screen, we don't get to see what Katakuri uses to beat him down, but Katakuri's got his trident now. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Katakuri is definitely the biggest threat next to Big Mom in this in this area. And uh, I can't wait to see more of him, man. He's such a good character. Uh, Luffy tries to fight Big Mom. Goes gear fourth, goes for the, the great punch, and of course Big Mom also uses arm in hockey and just stops it. Just says no. Uh, Luffy tells her they're coming back after they beat Kaido. And she basically tells him that, first off, he can't fight that thing, which makes me so much more excited to see Kaido, and that she's not letting him leave. Uh, they're almost out, though, when Caesar's stopped by Brule. And it just, it, it feels like this was what it always had to come to. The Straw Hats are not strong enough to beat Big Mom right now. I would have loved to see some, like come back from behind, defeating Big Mom thing, but they are just not strong enough right now. They need to be stronger to fight Ionko. And so thankfully, Stussy of course killed Dufeld, but Dufeld was trying to open the Tomatabako, and the Tomatabako goes off the side and explodes, and takes a large chunk of the castle with it. Just I don't, Not really takes it with it, but when it explodes, the explosion is so big that the castle is destabilized. And I'm very excited to see where that goes. Big Mom obviously was distressed by that, so I want to see if she's going to start another screaming fit, if she's going to instead think there's another attack going on, 
and let her guard down so the Straw Hats can get away. Very excited for that. Cannot wait to see uh, the next One Piece chapter. As usual, Oda just cranking out these great chapters. Next up is Boruto, chapter 14. Um, I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't really like this chapter. I loved the backgrounds of this chapter. The artist is doing a great job getting the backgrounds down. Uh, they look great. But Boruto fighting off these four guys who were supposed to be ninjas? Granted, low rank ninjas, but still takes them all alone? Not even including how he blocks a blade in midair and then kicks the guy that he blocked? Like, all his momentum stopped then. But he still was able to kick the guy away? Uh, I don't know. That just that felt a little too easy to me. I get it. Boruto is supposed to fight the big guy. But I expected this to be a multi-chapter fight, and uh, spoilers, it's not. So, there's a couple cool moments in this fight though, that I didn't want to highlight. Specifically, Boruto doing what looks like a Flying Lotus Kick. Uh, sort of what Lee would have used. Uh, this creepy, hairy guy who I don't even remember his name. It's not mentioned in this chapter, to my knowledge. Um, he has a Futon Zephyr Shield that allows him to repel any Jutsu. This guy seems like he's hardcore. He mentions at one point that he wants to eat Boruto so he can be young again, which tells me this guy's probably pretty old and probably does this quite a bit. Which leads to my question of if he's so powerful, if he, I mean, he clearly is powerful. He has the ability to eat people as long as their brain is alive and take their form, which means then that he can do anything that person could do. He has the Futon Zephyr shield to be able to block and repel any attacks, including the Rasengan, and the Futon Zephyr blade to be able to attack. This guy seems pretty strong. Why is he doing this whole ransom plot? What's the point of that? It seems like he could probably like, be doing just about anything on his own. He could be like trying to take over the Sound, who are still alone. Or, to my knowledge, anyway. Or there's just so many different things he could be doing other than a ransom plot to the Shogun's son. And that, that leads me to my next comment, my next complaint. This guy's supposed to be a trained ninja. He's beaten Boruto. But Tinto throws a shuriken that hits him in his back and he's like oh how dare you and turns around leaving himself wide open to attack for boruto and it just doesn't feel like something this guy would do like this guy's obviously been hit before otherwise he wouldn't have come up with his shield jutsu so it just feels a little weird when he just immediately forgets about boruto and how powerful boruto has been in this whole fight to turn around and face tento i mean this guy was counting shadow clones and while we're on the subject of shadow clones why is the official translation Shadow Doppelgangers in Boruto? The official translation for Naruto was Shadow Clones. But now it's Shadow Doppelgangers. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, that was Boruto. I'm gonna keep... Obviously, I'm gonna keep reading it every week, but I... Man, I don't know. Like, oh, come on, this guy is so powerful! This guy has one of the most powerful abilities. He lets you knock yourself out with your own jutsu, and while you're knocked out, he eats you, and then can do anything with your body. Like, why is this guy not pretending to be a Hokage? Why is this guy not beating a Hokage like this? One-on-one, -on -one, reflected their attacks back at them, eating the Hokage, taking over their body, is a Hokage. Like, that seems real clear. Or the Shogun! Forget this whole ransom plot of, we want money, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna ransom the Shogun's kid off. Eat the Shogun! Like, I don't know. I don't know. We'll move on. Robot Laser Beam number 16. This was a great chapter, by the way. This chapter had me so hype. I feel like every week is just hype with me for Robo and Laser Beam. So, Robo made some really good shots. Uh, Robo's getting into it. But Suzaku is getting into it so much more. He's barely able to contain himself at, at a couple different points here. And when... <laughs> When Robo looks at him, Suzaku just has this look on his face that I love so much where he's just like, don't look at me like that. If you look at me like that, I won't be able to control myself anymore. It's so good. Ah, oh, I love characters that can't contain their excitement. Like I love like characters that are just overcome with their own desire to do what it is they're doing. Like, if they're bad guys, it's desire to just do bad guy stuff, and they love it. I love that. If it's a good guy who just loves to fight, 
and they're reveling in the fight. I love that so much. And in sports manga or sports anime, that becomes the guy who loves the sport and who loves to crush people with the sport. And that's exactly what Suzaku is here. He's called the crazy perverted emperor. He's my new favorite character, man. Absolutely. The pose when he's going to do the lob shot. The pose is so cool. Like, it's such a weird thing to see this this crazy swing and him looking so incredibly pleased as he's doing it. And then his line at the end is, an emperor is never in danger. My man. My boy, Suzaku. Best character in Robo Laser Beam. Hope this gets an anime so I can see that scene. Oh, so good. Speaking of another show that deserves an anime, The Promised Neverland. Chapter 46. As usual, art on point. This chapter looks so good. The the cave that they're in, the backgrounds, the characters' faces when they're finally revealed, when they take their hoods off, just the, the faces of the characters that we already knew, like Emma and Ray, and then some of the some of the kids. It's so good, man. So Sanju and Mujika are the new characters to get introduced. And I assume it's supposed to be like song and music but sanju musica they look so intimidating on that cover page i love it i love it and then come to find out the reason ray figured it out was the feet i went back and looked at the last chapter couldn't see the feet love it so much normally i'd be upset that they didn't like show us that ahead of time so we could be with ray figuring it out it's fine i'm not even upset because when they take their hoods off and you get musica and sanju's designs and those designs are crazy good and they come to find out they're praying because they have a religion and the religion is that they don't eat humans. Ah, oh, so good. And then even to the fact that Sanju holds his hand out when he prays and Mujika holds her hand up when she prays. Like, I want to know who they're praying to. I want to know what religion is that. Like, I want to learn so much more about this world that this author does such a good job teasing you and tantalizing you with this world and it's so good and then of course we get the, the stinger the chapter ends with what is going on in the world right now and i really hope that that is picked up next week i really hope that's not left behind next week like i'm afraid it might be but i want to know so badly what's going on with the world so great chapter great chapter if you've been skipping the promised neverland you need to read it it's worth keeping up on it's it's absolutely worth reading week by week just like almost all these series are, really, honestly. Uh, we Never Learn, Chapter 22, is next. This is a Karisu chapter. And I love Karisu. She's great. She was the tutor before that was tutoring uh, Furuhashi and Ogata. It's, it's a great little chapter. <laughs> she tries to help Naruyuki Yuiga catch this cat. And she winds up hurting her leg. And so he takes her home. And then she falls again inside her house and he opens the door. And I've mentioned before how I feel about fan service in manga and anime. I'm not a huge fan of it. Uh, this was more funny fan service to me than it was serious fan service to me. Her bottom is in this chapter a whole lot. Let me lay that on the line right now. There's a lot more of fan service than just this one scene. But this one scene I felt like was perfectly reasonable. Uh, I found it real funny. Uh, to see her covered in books. And then, of course, Yuiga wants to help her clean. Like, she helps him study a little bit, and then he wants to help her clean because he can't stand a mess because he's Yuiga, and we all love him for it. So, <laughs> there are some really good gags, too. And just thinking about them made me completely pause there. The moment where she wants him to take out his study book, and she tells him to take it out, and he's just completely confused. The moment where he tells her he can't take it anymore... And she immediately is like, you know, you're underage. And he's like, huh? He says, I wanted to clean. And she's like, oh, let, let's clean. So they clean everything up. And he finds out that she used to be a figure skater. And the reasoning behind why she is the way she is, the fact that she wants to push people to what they're excellent at instead of what they want to do because of how her figure skating career turned out, to where Yuiga then responds that he's taking the path of regret, and she says they are in parallel. 
I've loved that phrase ever since Horizon of the Middle of Nowhere. And it, it's such a good moment where instead of showing the two characters looking at each other and you could, you know, have anything like that, they just show their feet. They're in parallel. Such a good scene. Immediately followed by Yuiga saying, but well, won't this be a problem? You had a man in your house. She's like, you're not even a man. You're a boy. And he leaves and she immediately ducks behind the balcony. It's like, I can't believe I had a man in my house. It's it's so out of character for her, but at the same time, so in character for her. It's what she's really like, and I love it. I can't wait to see more Kurisu. She's amazing. Uh, cutest scene of all the chapters this week. Absolutely. The balcony scene. So now we move on to Black Clover 116. And you guys know my thoughts on Black Clover. I feel like uh, a lot of times the main plot is very rough. But I love the characters. And this, this man, this author knows how to pull me in with new characters. Because Kirsch is great. Kirsch is amazing. Kirsch Vermilion man just comes on stage and steals the show immediately. Getting to see Mimosa hating him. Like, we don't get to see that out of Mimosa normally. She's normally this prim and proper character until she sees Asta and then she's head over heels for him. And having Kirsch just immediately bring out a new side of her is great. Magna doesn't like him. Soul doesn't like him. Soul throws up because he touches her. But Kirsch is so good. The fight starts. Magna immediately, you know, wants to fight on his own. And Kirsch is like, hey, well, if you did this, it'd, it'd be better. Magna's like, oh, yeah, I mean, I guess it would. And then Soul summons her golem and goes to attack. And Kirsch is like, hey, I mean, actually, you know, if if you had five golems instead of one, you could split up your offensive. It'd be a lot better. She's like, oh, yeah, that actually seems really good. Meanwhile, Kirsch is defending the crystal. Kirsch, vice commander of the Peacocks, uses cherry blossom magic. So we haven't seen people use cherry blossoms in an offensive way since Byakuya Kuchki, really. And I feel like a lot of people are afraid to because Byakuya Kuchki used them in a really cool way. This is way better, in my opinion. This is so much better. Because instead of it being just like a quick flurry of them in the sky or like... A thousand of them scattered around the ground. They are visible in the air. And he has complete movement inside him once he's got them set up. It's such a cool... Like the panel where you see it. And then he's got the pass made straight to the enemy crystal for Magna and Soul. Just the entire chapter was great, man. It makes me excited for more Black Clover. Because I feel like when they're focusing on other characters than Asta. The story really shines. I feel like Asta is more of a vehicle to get us to where we're going. And I'm afraid that a lot of the story is going to focus on him when these other side characters are so cool. Next up is Shokugeki no Shoma. Shokugeki no Soma. I trip over that every time for some reason. Chapter 20, 222. Boss Megishima. I love the idea that Megishima went around, the, around all of Japan and proved himself as like the Yakuza Don of ramen. Nobody else compares. Everybody calls him Young Master or Boss Magishima. It's so good. And then his line, I don't want my ramen to be used as a tool for war. Ah! Oh! Magishima. Magishima, Magishima. Why do you keep surprising me? Why do I love you more and more as time passes? <coughs> You're so good. And then you can hear it's like, okay, yeah. But I still need your help. So let's fight for it. I'm going to beat you at a battle of ramen. And Megishima, who always turns people down, is like, oh, no, you're not. Let me show you. Soma getting destroyed by that food, by his reactions to the food and how badly it's beating him up, is just as good as always. I love it so much in the panel where he's just getting, like, devastated. He's getting thrashed by these noodles. And it's like, when... When did I ever believe in my life I would see a manga panel of a character getting thrashed by noodles? You know? It's so good. And at the end of the chapter, of course, you know, you can hear it passes out. But he said that he wants a world where everybody can be free to make whatever food they want. And Megishima is like, yeah, it's your win. It's Yuki Hero's win, and it wasn't even a fight. So good, man. Can't wait for can't wait for next chapter. I want to see how his 
how his duel turns out, his Shokugeki. Dr. Stone number 18. So I was super concerned about Chrome last week, as you might remember. All those concerns are gone now. I love Chrome. He's got the collar jacket. He calls himself a sorcerer. He's actually relatively smart. I mean, not compared to Senku, but compared to everybody else. Dude's a genius. And just the fact that he won't give up without a fight. He has his three contests with the fire, with the orb, and he does a math contest, which of course Senku aces, no problem. It's so good, man. I cannot wait to see what happens. And Senku's line, where he's like, see? Even if you had killed Misukasa, it wouldn't matter. Science would still prevail. There were so many good moments in this chapter. Secret technique, it's someone else's problem. Hey, Chrome, come deal with this. Ugh. And then that panel where Senku has a hand on his hip and is standing in front of Chrome and is clearly taller than Chrome to give you the clear the clear orientation that Senku is Chrome's boss now, basically. That Senku will always be better than Chrome when it comes to science. And Chrome has his head like slightly tilted down to prove that he's in submission. He's lost. So good, man. Can't wait for more Dr. Stone. Continues to surprise uh, and completely undo all of my worries every chapter. Next up we have My Hero Academia, chapter 144. This was one of my favorite chapters in all of Book of No Hero. Not a lot happens, really. It's just Kurishima dealing with his own inner demons. Like, he wants to be like Crimson Riot. That's all he wants to do. He just wants to be like Crimson Riot. But his power is to harden his body. It's not to be flashy. It's not to be special. It's to harden his body. And it just, it feels, it feels bad. Because you see him wanting to do it. But then when a crisis does happen, he doesn't dive in. Ashido does. And he hears on the news about how Deku did. But he doesn't. And it just, it, it's a really good parallel to Deku as a character. Because you have Deku, Midoriya, who has no quirk. Wants to be a hero, no matter what. And desperately fights against his own fate. To the point where he almost dies multiple times. Then you have Kurishima, who has a quirk. Desperately wants to be like his hero. But can't bring up the courage to fight. And I can't wait to find out more about his character, man. Kurishima, I felt like a lot of us slept on him. Like, he was kind of important in a couple arcs, but he wasn't really super special. And, man, this arc, he has he has shown himself. We've had so many good heroes already this arc. And I can't wait to see more. I just want to see more Boku no Hero. Uh, the weak wait between this One Piece and Dr. Stone is killing me. Next up is Hunter Hunter 363. I mean, we're still on the boat. We're still in this Nin Beast arc. First person Benjamin seems pretty cool. Like Benjamin seems like a pretty interesting character. He's he's able to get very angry and, and very powerful, but he's also able to calm himself down and look at things like statistically and strategically. It's like okay, yeah, that's a, that's a decent character idea. And everybody on the boat seems to be indebted almost to Karapika for letting them know about the Nin Beast. But man, I don't know. Like all these royal guards are now characters. And it already felt like we had too many characters in this arc that we didn't care about. I don't know. I'm, I want... I don't even know what I want, really. I. This is supposed to be like Karapika's story, but most of this is going on with all these other characters that aren't him. And I was kind of excited to start this, this arc out with a Karapika story, and he's done some cool stuff... But it, just, it feels like this arc is wrapped around these Nin Beasts and these children. Which I guess technically it always was going to be. And I just don't really like most of these characters. I don't really like most of these Nin Beasts. So I don't know. We'll, we'll move on. Hopefully it, it picks up a little bit. I mean, I, I trust Togashi. Great author, but we'll see. Blue Exorcist number 92. Now, like, like Black Clover and like uh, Seraph of the End... This is a series that I think has some good characters in it that I'm not super fan of how the plot goes sometimes. There were some really cool reveals this chapter, though. Like, a bunch more people are seeing the demons. 
and they're even taking videos of exorcists fighting them, which is really cool. Because this was one of the big things that, that people couldn't see them, and so it was safe to fight them wherever. Now people can see them, so now it's not safe to fight them wherever. And the more people that see them, the more like the stronger they get because people are believing in them. So I'm very excited to see where that goes. We have like Shura and Lightning being a great team. But in that whole time, you have Lightning being super suspicious. Like he's always is. Yukio, you know, still being his Avenger self and still being super dark and almost edge lord. He's not quite there yet, but he's getting close. Uh, it just it feels like there's too many sides in this battle. Like there's too many different groups within the same groups all doing different things. Like Lightning's doing something and he's got some people on his side and Yukio's doing some stuff and he's got some people on his side and then Lightning gets captured by the church but right before he gets captured, he gives Yukio a password and a flash drive that who knows how long Yukio didn't realize that flash drive was in his other hand. That's a little weird. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is, it's just so many factions. And in all that, you have Rin just going, I hope Yukio got something warm to eat tonight because it's snowing outside. And I feel like we've got so far from that original story of these two brothers working together into this intrigue that I don't know how happy I am with it. You know, it just feels like it's pulling itself away from what I originally liked about the series. But again, there were some cool fights. That Cyclops blowing up part of the city was really cool. Them reading out the ancient legend and know how to exercise it was really cool. I want to see more of that kind of stuff. But with the main cast, who haven't really done much except go to a wedding lately. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. So that will wrap up this week's edition of the Weekly Shonen Jump Breakdown. If you have any emails or any comments you'd like to make in the comments below, uh, please talk about what your thoughts on this chapter were, or on this, this list of chapters, this week's issue was. I would like to know how you guys felt about some of these. Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? Are you super hype about these Nin Beasts and Hunter Hunter? How do you feel about Chrome? What's going on with... Uh, Karisu, and maybe you feel like Boruto was doing just fine against this guy, and it's totally fine that he beat him. Just let us know in the comments below, or send an email to the Full Spectrum Podcast at gmail.com. Again, I've been Trey. I'll see you guys next week for another episode of the Weekly Shonen Jump Breakdown. And remember to always enjoy the full spectrum of what Shonen Jump has to offer. <laughs>